I'm pleased to uh, go on to our next presenter. We are very happy to now have Mr. David Carroll, who is president and CEO of the Gas Technology Institute, to now make his presentation. David. Thank you, Marjorie. It's a pleasure to be with you, and, and thank you to you and Sheila for all you do in leading and coordinating these uh, events uh, like this, but also just providing leadership to this uh, sector in general. Um, over the past decade, our country has undergone a, a sea change in how we think about energy and its impacts on the environment and our global competitiveness. And we've heard a lot about that uh, today already. It's pretty clear that there are many technologies that we have in the pocket that we can deploy between now and 2030 uh, to reduce carbon emissions particularly in, in power generation. But to get to levels of decarbonization that we really need to get to post-2030, we have to expand our view economy-wide. So at GTI, we're driving this next wave of innovation. We're working hard with partners in the industry to shape this energy landscape from now to mid-century. So how do we see this playing out? Well, like uh, my preceding speakers, Dina and Charlie, we're, we're bullish on natural gas, and we anticipate that global demand for gases and liquid fuels are going to remain robust for decades to come. Hydrogen emerges as a significant energy carrier by 2040. Advanced bioenergy and low-carbon gas to liquid fuels will contribute to the mix. And uh, to be clear, we, can, we see a continued role for responsibly sourced low emission natural gas as we move down this overall path to net zero. So as we look, look at the next slide, we see that a global energy transition is, is well underway. And amidst this global backdrop, the US administration has set in motion a strategy for a net zero economy by 2050 in a carbon-free power sector by 2035. Ambitious indeed, and these policies and investments should spur broad deployment of renewable energy. We've seen corporations and governments around the world accelerating their commitments to achieve carbon neutrality, and investors are lining up behind clean energy projects. Last November, COP26 provided significant momentum for this transition. And although the pledges at COP26 fell short of closing this gap to one and a half degrees C of warming, there are reasons to be optimistic. Countries with net zero pledges increased from 68 to 81, and now cover nearly three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions and 90% of global GDP. Companies with net zero pledges now represent one third of the largest listed companies in the G20. And that share has increased by 60% just over the last couple of years. So as we move to the next slide, we see that this global race is on and the US needs to meet the moment. So what we have to do is figure out how we can put the existing energy infrastructure, which is so expansive and effective, how we put that existing energy infrastructure to work in storing and transporting and delivering lower carbon molecules and integrating those molecules with other low carbon energy system components, such as wind, solar, and battery storage. Disruptive innovations are needed in this carbon intensive economy that we have, industry, manufacturing, chemicals, and advances in energy, uh, energy efficiency Lower carbon gases and fuels will help those sectors transition. Let's move on to the next slide and we see um, that uh, we have some work to do. The IEA reported record breaking levels of capital spent on clean energy startups last year. Record breaking levels, but it's nowhere near enough. They suggest that to get to net zero by 2050, we're gonna to have to increase annual investment levels by more than four times by the end of this decade. The market opportunity for clean technology is driving both investment 
and also international competition as new energy supply chains are formed and deployed. And you should just see the, uh, the uh, patents uh, coming out of China for clean energy and, and uh, electric transportation. It's, uh, it's amazing. That said, the U.S. Uh, continues uh, to represent about half of this capital being invested, but Europe and China are indeed ramping up. So current work uh, to improve the energy efficiency of homes and buildings and vehicles, coupled with more renewables and electrification are important. But it's not enough to rise to this challenge of deep decarbonization economy-wide. To get to that point, we need high potential innovations to be demonstrated at scale, think big, and in the field in real world energy systems and applications. Starting today and uh, very aggressively over the next decade. And efforts such as the LCRI that GTI has partnered with with EPRI are aimed at meeting this challenge. I'd like to take uh, now uh, just a few minutes to highlight some of the work that we're doing at GTI that supports global decarbonization while expanding access to uh, the low cost clean energy that economies need worldwide. Moving on uh, to the next slide, we talk about hydrogen. Clearly it's emerging with intriguing global potential as an energy carrier. It's of course produced in several ways by hydrocarbons, biomass, even electricity. And some have lower carbon footprints than others and some are higher cost or lower cost than others. And there's been considerable attention spent on the production of hydrogen through electronic, uh, electrolysis, green hydrogen, if you will. And that effort and that research is important, but equally important are near-term opportunities to produce mass amounts of lower carbon hydrogen from the abundant supply of low-cost natural gas that we have in the U.S. and elsewhere, with carbon capture, of course, to minimize its footprint. And we believe that this blue hydrogen will play a key role in energy transitions. But success with blue hydrogen and frankly, uh, hydrogen in general, depends on our ability to build a market, as you see here, but also drive down that cost curve of hydrogen production. And we're not alone in this view. Uh, the recent BP energy outlook projects that by mid-century, 95% of hydrogen or most of hydrogen is going to come from roughly the same amounts of green and blue. In the next slide, we talk about our hydrogen technology center. Yep. At GTI, we're investing, our, partner, our partners are investing in technologies and practices that we need to enable this hydrogen economy. Reimagining a hydrogen energy value chain, if you will. And the Hydrogen Technology Center is one tool to make this happen. And it goes beyond typical research projects that tend to be focused on single technologies or items. And instead, our tech center operates across multiple projects and sectors into what might be called hydrogen hubs. One of the tech center's most exciting innovations is a novel hydrogen generator. I've listed many of these projects on the slide here. But this generator enables large-scale hydrogen production from natural gas, utilizing a pre-combustion capture. It replaces the steam methane reformer, which reduces equipment costs, improves efficiency, and creates a concentrated CO2 byproduct. In our aggressive technology development scenario, we envision large-scale demonstrations over just the next several years and commercial sales by the end of the decade. Let's talk about, uh, in the lower right there, uh, hydrogen at scale. At the port of Houston, GTI and its partners are working on a large scale demonstration project of a hydrogen hub that's part of the hydrogen at scale project in Texas. It introduces hydrogen into existing facilities and networks, including some of the nearby oil refineries and pipelines. And it's on track to be a first of its kind integration of commercial hydrogen production, distribution, storage, and use in the energy sector. And this project brings together partners across the value chain 
and we're going to be demonstrating infrastructure safety and reliability and illustrate that this renewable hydrogen can be a cost-effective fuel for multiple end uses, from fuel cell electric vehicles to baseload stationary power. And finally, the, the high blend project here. As you've heard earlier today, you know, our US uh, energy systems are a modern marvel. I mean, they're incredibly integrated, they're interdependent, and the natural gas system alone represents nearly 3 million miles of pipelines that deliver energy to a diversity of customers and communities. And these systems, they're, they're vast, but connected, needed, but often unnoticed, but they deliver every day reliability, safety, and affordability. And they do provide immense storage capacity to address grid scale seasonal demand variations. So figuring out how to best introduce hydrogen into this existing infrastructure is a critical step for broad deployment. NREL is addressing technical barriers at a large scale to blend hydrogen in natural gas pipelines. GTI is part of the effort as well, as we coordinate participation with gas industry leaders and stakeholders, assessing hydrogen compatibility with existing pipeline materials and operations. As we see in the next slide, advanced biofuels will play a role, uh, will play a role also. In this pathway to a low carbon future, I'm not sure how we get there without lower carbon liquid fuels. And, and to that end, IEA estimates that modern bioenergy needs to increase roughly fourfold in terms of its output uh, between now and 2060 to stay on that path to below two degrees of warming. In the near term, we see a growing role, as some have mentioned here today, for renewable natural gas pipeline quality gas that comes from biomass sources, such as waste landfills and manure. But that only gets you part of the way. We think other technologies are needed to get that renewable natural gas produced at even larger scales. Which brings us to the next slide, Sun Gas Renewables, which is a subsidiary that GTI launched just last year that leverages decades of experience in gasification to expand renewable energy supply. It's based on our UGAS process and it creates low carbon gases and fuels from wood waste while reducing the effects of those waste streams on the environment. Over the past 40 years, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested to develop and deploy the sun gas technology in facilities around the world. So we do think that it offers very intriguing prospects that uh, so let's move on to a very uh, important topic. My last one of the, uh, of the afternoon here. And it's, uh, it's one to keep gas in the mix in the money. We're in a methane moment. In 2021, the IPCC stated that reducing methane emissions is the planet's best hope for achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. We all know that methane represents a powerful greenhouse gas. And reducing methane emissions from human activity represents the fastest and least expensive way to put a break on this global warming this decade. So governments, investors, and companies are embracing and demanding aggressive climate action. And we see this playing out in the policy arena with actions like a global methane pledge to reduce emissions 30% by 2030. And in the investment community where managers representing trillions in assets are steering their funds to companies and to strategies aimed at achieving net zero by 2050. Having a diverse set of stakeholders working together to foster robust methane emissions management is critical. And at GTI, we've often sat in the middle of industry collaborative approaches uh, to address methane management, such as CAMS and Project Astra. And now we have a new one. It's called Veritas. Several months ago, we launched Veritas, which is a differentiated gas initiative that brings together the industry, scientists, academics, 
environmental and certification organizations, and the financial industry to develop standard protocols to calculate measurement informed methane emissions for natural gas systems. Veritas is going to help operators develop accurate emissions inventories for every segment of the natural gas supply chain with data that's suitable for an array of applications, including responsible gas certification and financial reporting requirements. So next slide in closing, the energy industry leaders that are present today in this virtual room are, are no strangers to innovation. And collectively, you bring broad expertise and financial strength. I have no doubt that together we can deliver the low carbon, low cost future that the world requires. And at GTI, we aim to be part of that effort because we firmly believe that technology is going to be a key enabler to building those sustainable pathways that balance both economic and environmental interests. So that's the goal. Uh, we can't afford to fail, and I thank you for uh, hearing me out. Marjorie, back to you. Wonderful. David, thank you so much for your presentation. We truly appreciate it. Um, I have time for a few questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I want to go back to what you alluded to in one of your presentations on the role of human activity. Can you talk a little bit about GTI's work with the Department of Defense to reduce their need for facility energy and to deploy cost-effective, efficient energy solutions for buildings, on-site generation and resilience? Yeah, you hit a key word there, Marjorie, and, 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 and certainly one of those all along in our work with the Department of uh, uh, Defense, particularly in bases, is resiliency. Uh, resiliency against a variety of potential threats, right? Whether they're human uh, malevolent threats or, or climate events or weather events. So we've done a lot of work uh, with uh, the department uh, at bases to look at how we can make these really uh, interesting and contained yet very extensive energy uh, networks and systems to be resilient increasingly now uh, to be um, um, efficient as well, both from an energy use standpoint and an emission standpoint. Again, bases represent a uh, sort of manageable um, uh, scale uh, opportunities to experiment with higher efficiency equipment, uh, to demonstrate the integration of electric and gas systems to produce both an efficient and a resilient uh, structure and we've been uh, receiving uh, broad support from the Department of Defense in order to meet some of those objectives. Thank you so much for that response. I wanna go back a little bit also about your uh, discussion on your Hydrogen Technology Center. Have you seen there has been more of an emphasis on one sort of innovation over the others in the short term? And if so, which one has that been? I think Marjorie, it's, it, it's a very broad response. Again, I, my earlier career, I came from the industrial gas sector, the hydrogen sector, and for decades, hydrogen has been a commodity that's been produced by experts and sold to experts in terms of industrial customers and NASA and so forth. And now we're talking about introducing it into a broader economy. So con consequently, we're looking at uh, a variety of efforts. Um, GTI is, a, is part of many, and, and, and certainly this is a worldwide activity, looking at both ways to produce hydrogen uh, in a lower cost manner and in a cleaner manner, in fact, using perhaps uh, excess renewable energy, uh, again, to, uh, uh, to ele electrolyze uh, seawater or other sources of water to produce the hydrogen. But also, very importantly, looking at how hydrogen when introduced into an energy system interacts with the other components, whether it's the infrastructure, control systems, end use equipment such as boilers, chemical processes, and even your grandmother's range in her house, and how that's all going to work, both as a blend and perhaps even as 100% uh, hydrogen in some applications. So Marjorie, I guess you would say this is a, a full frontal assault uh, from many directions to look at all the challenges, but also the opportunities that come with introducing a new a commodity into an energy system. Wonderful. Thank you for that. 
Unfortunately, in the interest of time, we can't continue this conversation. I can sit down and continue to pick your brain. I've got tons of questions I want to ask you about battery storage, but we'll have to do that for another time. David, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. My great pleasure. Thanks for the honor of being with you.